Hi, we're having a conversation with Dr. Eduardo Velázquez. He is professor of politics at the Washington and Lee University. Um, Dr. Velázquez, uh, we know Adam Smith mostly because of his famous book, the, in, An Inquiry on the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. Um, his, it is his most famous book. But Smith also authored another book, which is called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And it was published in 1759. And we are celebrating the 250th anniversary of, of the book. Um, and this is a work on moral philosophy. Why do you think that uh, Smith is most remembered because of the wealth of nations rather than because of the moral sentiments? You know, the, the, the relationship between wealth, economics, and morality has now become, once again, in the midst of this economic crisis, such an important topic. Um, so it, this, is, this is probably something that we can come back to. But let me say at the outset that I, I think one of the reasons may, may, uh, may be something that we can attribute to a, to, a Smithian, to a Smithian insight, namely the division of labor. I think one of the reasons why uh, we don't turn to the theory of moral sentiments is um, because Smith founded the, the science, the science of, of economics. And I think um, nowadays in universities, to become versed in a discipline requires so much, so much labor. And there's a way in which economics has developed as an autonomous discipline in which um, perhaps people don't see the connection between the science of economics and humanistic disciplines. But that was certainly not the case for Adam Smith. In fact, he believed that the theory of moral sentiments was in fact his most important book. He revised it six times until his death in 1790. And he thought that there was actually a correspondence between his moral outlook and the kind of burgeoning free market economy um, that he was witnessing in the 18th century. Well, one cannot separate uh, morals from the respect of uh, property, of uh, the right to life, and, and all the things that are involved in, in economic decisions, of course. That's right. And, but I think more importantly, and this is, um, I think, a, an issue that has been hotly debated in Adam Smith himself, is that one of the reasons people don't turn to the theory of moral sentiment is because it is founded on a psychological principle of sympathy, our capacity to identify with the plight of other human beings, with their own sentiments uh, and dispositions. And when people turn to the wealth of nations, they turn to that very famous passage, right, in which it says that, you know, I don't, I don't expect my dinner from the charity of a butcher, right? I always appeal, I always appeal to their self-interest. So that the, that the science of economics and the wealth of nations is somehow based on self-interest. And so in turning to the wealth of nations, people wonder, well, what is this a peculiar account of sympathy? And this gives rise, I think, to a, to a kind of dichotomy between the two books that the people aren't able to reconcile, although I believe that, in fact, they, they are reconcilable. And um, now we will go back to psychology uh, later, but uh, I would like to address uh, an issue which, uh, which is very popular, the famous phrase, the invisible hand. And uh, nowadays, many people make fun of the invisible hand, uh, looking for or towards uh, more regulation, more intervention in the market. What is the importance of that concept uh, in uh, Adam Smith's uh, work? I think in, in the crudest way, um, or the, perhaps the simplest way to put it, is that the invisible hand is, is a bit like the law of unintended consequences, right? Uh, Adam Smith said that if human beings given enough liberty, what he called easy taxes, a minimal amount of the administration of justice, if each human being were in effect left to pursue you know, the dictates of his own conscience, to pursue um, the acquisition of wealth, that in effect the sum of these individual pursuits 
would in fact yield yield the common good, right? So I, I, I think Smith is often regarded, and I think correctly, as one of the, the early fathers of, of liberalism for just, for just this reason. Um, now let's enter to this uh, psychology issue. Um, you have mentioned uh, the psychologist side of, uh, of Adam Smith, and today at least the task of a moral philosopher and a psychologist uh, seems to be different. Uh, one would say that a moral philosopher is more, like, is more likely to be found in a university, in a classroom, and a psychologist is mostly found in a clinic, for example. Uh, now, uh, what do you mean when you say that Adam Smith was a psychologist? That's a, that's a good question, and I think that this, this area of examination in Adam Smith um, uh, would, prove, would prove very, very fruitful. Adam Smith in the theory of moral sentiments, um, shows himself not to be a rationalist. In fact, he says that the way in which we go about in regulating our own behavior comes through imagining ourselves as creatures that are being seen. So he has this wonderful metaphor of the theater of the world to explain the ways in which human beings behave. Now his turn to the imagination, his own um, articulation of the nature of consciousness, strikes me as very, very close to what contemporary psychologists are now saying about both the nature and the content of the human mind. That in some sense, the passions, the sentiments, are very, very important in understanding how it is that we operate, um, operate morally. That in fact, when we, when, we, when we engage in moral action, it's not always some kind of crude calculation of utility, but that, the, that, that our moral action is in a sense uh, a very sentimental action. And so what psychologists today are calling the embodied, but the embodied mind, that somehow to understand the mind also means to understand a, a host of, of um, physical processes is, I think, anticipated by Smith by, by well over 200 years.